Good morning and welcome everyone to this year's meeting of the Developmental and Reproductive Toxicant Identification Committee. The meeting is being held virtually. My name is Lauren Zeiss. I'm Director of the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. This is a department within the California Environmental Protection Agency. So I'm really looking forward to today's meeting. Um, before we start with uh, introducing the committee and staff, um, I'll high level um, go over the agenda and also how the public may comment during the meeting. So our main agenda item uh, today is the use of zebrafish in assessing developmental and reproductive health hazards. Zebrafish are increasingly being used as a model organism in toxicity testing including for uh, developmental and reproductive toxicity testing. OE has included zebrafish study data and other types of new toxicological data in our hazard identification documents. We've prepared today's session to discuss the scientific underpinnings and further explore the use of zebrafish evidence in identifying chemicals posing reproductive hazards. A conversation we hope will help inform our future use of these data in our hazard identification documents and co committee deliberations. We're looking forward to um, presentations from four invited speakers, as well as the committee's questions and discussion of scientific issues and the public's comments. After the zebrafish agenda item, the committee will take up a consent item on the section 27,000 list of chemicals which, for which testing has been required but has not been adequate. Um, this is different, a different list than the Proposition 65 list. There aren't going to be any listing decisions before the committee today. <clears throat> for the third and final agenda item, staff will present updates on chemical listing via administrative listing mechanisms, safe harbor levels, and other uh, regulations, as well as litigation from the past uh, year. Um, then we'll, we'll, during the meeting, we'll be taking a 45 minute break for lunch around noon. And we'll also take a short 15 minute break uh, around uh, 2.15 in the afternoon. So this meeting is being recorded and transcribed. The transcript will be posted on OES website. Okay, so for public comment, um, during the meeting, there'll be an opportunity to provide public comment after the zebrafish agenda item. And you can see on the screen here, individuals who wish to make oral comment at the meeting are asked to do two things. First, join the Zoom webinar. Um, and so for those of you watching by Cal EPA webcast, you'll be able to watch the meeting, but you'll need to join the meeting by Zoom in order to speak. Information on how to how to um, join via Zoom is shown on the slide. You go to the um, let's see, yes, this uh, uh, web address https colon to backslashes bit dot dot ly backslash D A R T I C underscore registration underscore 2022. Um, so you'll receive a link to join the webinar at the end of the registration process. And if you provided a working email address, you'll also receive an email with a link to join the webinar. Um, then once we begin uh, public comment, please raise your hand using the raise hand function on Zoom to indicate you would like to speak. So again, on the Zoom bar on at least my screen, you have a menu bar on the bottom of the screen and you can see the raised hand there. Um, it might not be the same on every screen. Um, when your name is called, you'll be prompted to unmute yourself. Please unmute and then state your name and affiliation if you wish to state your name and affiliation and provide your comment. And comment will be limited to five minutes per commenter. 
Okay, so that's the public comments. Now let's turn and introduce our committee. So I'm very pleased to introduce members of the Developmental and Reproductive Toxicant Identification Committee or DART IC. If um, when you're in, introduced, if you could turn on your camera and state your name and affiliation. So we'll start with Dr. Patrick Allard, who um, will be actually chairing the first hour of this meeting today, uh, absent our, our chair during the first hour. So Patrick. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Patrick Allard. I'm an associate professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, in the department uh, or the Institute of Society and Genetics. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Dr. Ian Kim. Oh, Diane, you're um, muted. Okay. Hi, my name is Diana, uh, Dr. Diana Al Young Kim, and I am currently executive director at uh, Genentech in the Department of Safety Assessment. Thanks, Diane. Dr. Baskin. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Larry Baskin. I am uh, Chief of Pediatric Urology at UCSF Children's Hospitals, and thanks for including me on the committee for all these years. Great. Dr. Carmichael. Good morning. I'm Susan Carmichael. I'm a professor at Stanford University in pediatrics and OBGYN. Dr. Hertz Picciotto. Sorry. Uh, good morning. I'm Irva Hertz Picciotto. I'm professor in epidemiology and in environmental and occupational health at the University of California, Davis. Uh, where I also direct the uh, UC Davis Environmental Health Sciences Center. Thank you. Dr. Um, Ulrike Luter is next alphabetically in line, but she will be joining us in, um, in about an hour. Uh, Dr. Pessa. Good morning, everyone. Isaac Pessa here, uh, professor of toxicology at UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine in the Department of Molecular Biosciences. Dr. Plopper. Hey, Dr. Yeah. Plopper, you'll have to unmute. Yeah, here. yeah I'm I'm unmuted. Uh, this is, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, Charlie Plopper, Professor Emeritus, UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. Um, very like Dr. Baskin. Appreciate being included on this very important committee. Thank you. Great, thank you. Dr. Woodruff. Hi, my name is Tracy Woodruff. I'm a professor in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences at University of California, San Francisco. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. Really looking forward to the discussion. Um, now I'm going to introduce the OES staff um, and also invite them to turn uh, on their cameras as they're introduced. So um, Carolyn Rowan, uh, our chief counsel, this is Carolyn's first DART IC committee meeting. Hi, thanks, Lauren. Um, I'm Carolyn Rowan. I am the chief counsel at OEHA and I uh, just started in August. So. Uh, thank you. Yeah, welcome. Okay, Dr. Vince Cogliano. Who's our, go ahead, Vince, give your title, that'd be great. Oh, you're muted. Good morning, everyone. Sorry about that. I'm Vince Cogliano, direct, Deputy Director for Scientific Programs here at OEHA. Pleased to meet you all. Dr. Martha Sandy. Good morning to everyone. I'm Martha Sandy. I'm um, chief of the Reproductive and Cancer Hazard Assessment Branch. Thank you all for joining. Okay, Dr. 
Francisco Moran, who's our new section chief of the Reproductive Toxicology and Epidemiology section. This is his first meeting in his new position. Good morning, happy to be here. Thank you very much for the introduction. <clears throat> um, Dr. Melissa, Marlissa Campbell, who we'll be hearing from today. Um, hi, I'm a staff toxicologist specializing in development mental and reproductive toxicology. Thank you, Lauren. Sure. And then from our um, Office of External and <clears throat> Legislative Affairs and Proposition 65 program, Dr. Amy Gilson. Good morning, everyone. Amy Gilson here, Deputy Director of External and Legislative Affairs. Julian Lichty. Good morning, Julian Lichty, Special Assistant for Programs and Legislation. And Esther Barajas Ochoa. Hi, good morning. Anna is here. <laughs> Great, well, thank you all. And um, now I'm going to turn the meeting over to Carolyn Rowan for some introductory remarks about Bagley-Keene or any other legal issues related to participation in the virtual meeting of the committee today. Carolyn. Thanks, Lauren. Good morning, everyone. I just have a few points to make before we get underway today. Um, I just want to remind everyone that this is a public meeting and under Bagley Keene, all discussions and deliberations for this group need to be conducted during the meeting, not on breaks or during lunch or with individual members of the committee. That includes both um, on or offline, including phone, emails, chats, or text messages. So uh, just generally, we're going to uh, have the discussion regarding subjects of the agenda during the meeting time. Uh, please feel free to ask me any questions at any time during the meeting. I'll be here the whole time. If I do have to step away for some reason, uh, Senior Staff Counsel Christy Morioka will cover for me. Uh, welcome, Christy. <laughs> and uh, so there will always be an attorney here if you have any questions. And that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, all right. Now we're ready to start the main body of the meeting. I'll turn the meeting over to Dr. Allard. And um, again, Dr. Allard serving as the acting chair for the first hour um, of the meeting until Dr. Luter arrives. On to you. All right. Well, thank you, Lauren, and thank you, Carolyn. So good morning. It is my pleasure to welcome the committee members and all the members of the public. I see we have quite a few attendees uh, who are all joining us today for this .IC committee meeting. So uh, we are ready now to move to the main agenda item, which is the session on the use of zebrafish data in developmental and reproductive toxicity health hazard assessment. So we will be therefore discussing the use of zebrafish data um, for DART, for developmental and reproductive, reproductive toxicity, sorry. And as Lauren already alluded to, this is important because the use of zebrafish in toxicology has really grown exponentially in the last 15 years. As the toxicity testing in the 21st century paradigm and endeavor uh, gain momentum. So it's really important to understand the strength and limitations of this model with regards to hazard identification. So um, the way that we'll uh, go ahead uh, um, and start with is with um, an introductory presentation by OEH staff, starting with Dr. Moran. Francisco. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Allard. Uh, as, as you were saying, uh, every year we, we find that the use of several fish as an animal model for developmental and reproductive toxicity is increasing. If one does a quick search on PubMed on, on, on DART effect for a particular chemical, it is not unusual to find that the search results include a number of studies published within the last 10 years or so using several fish as an animal model. And interestingly, the number of several fish studies that came up in the search can be similar to the number of studies performing classical mammalian test species. 
we, you know, in OIHA have been including this type of data in, in our recent hazard identification documents. After today's uh, meeting, we will have a better understanding on the physiology application and value of the use of the zebra fish in DART hazard assessment. I would like to thank all the participants and invited the speakers and, the, and of course the DART IEC and the public for joining us today. Now I would like to uh, give the podium to my colleague as I'm start setting the slide here, screen share, okay. So uh, Dr. Marlisa Campbell that it will uh, give a more extended introduction on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pancho. Um, good morning. I'm going to be giving just a brief overview of how OEHA has been using data from zebrafish in our hazard identification documents and how that's evolved through the years, um, given the increasing availability of data and the understanding of the relevance of zebrafish to human health. Pancha, can you put it in presentation mode? Yeah, it was, yes. I was trying to. There. Okay. Yeah. Sorry um, about that. <laughs> that's okay. Um, can we go to the next slide? Yes. Our earlier uh, hazard identification documents were that were prepared on chemicals under consideration by the DART IC uh, for listing as reproductive toxicants under California's Proposition 65 have included summaries uh, and discussion of relevant studies that conducted in zebrafish where those were available, as well as other non-mammalian models of different kinds, cell culture, whole embryo culture. But generally, they were presented as part of additional relevant information rather than give a more equal weight with mammalian and human data streams. Uh, more recent hazard identification documents have taken advantage of advances in the application of the zebrafish model to incorporate the zebrafish data alongside the mammalian whole animal data, as well as with mechanistic considerations. And just to illustrate some, uh, some of the comparisons and questions that have arisen from this more integrative approach, I just have a few slides to share based on the two most recent hazard identification documents, the documents on cannabis and on PFNA and PFDA. Can, can we go to the next slide? In OEHA's 2019 hazard identification document, evidence on the developmental toxicity of cannabis, smoke and Delta 9 THC, there were four neurobehavioral studies conducted in zebrafish that were included among the animal derived data that were presented. Three of these studies used a visual motor response test, which is a behavioral test relying on the integrity of the central and peripheral nervous system, including the visual system, as well as on normal locomotor and skeletal system development. The fourth study involved exposure of zebrafish embryos to Delta 9 THC during gastrulation period of development and the effects observed included changes in locomotor responses to sound as opposed to vision and also uh, the observed effects on heart rate, motor neuron morphology and synaptic activity at the neuromuscular junction, all findings which could be related to changes in calcium ion homeostasis during neurodevelopment. Um, in Zebrafish embryos by 48 hours post-fertilization expression of the endocannabinoid receptor CB1R is widespread throughout the zebrafish central nervous system. And it's found within the preoptic area, the telencephalon, the hypothalamus, the tegmentum, and the anterior hindbrain. And overall, generally, the findings in zebrafish supported effects that were also seen in mammalian models. Can we go to the next slide? Turning to consideration of the effects of the compound PFNA on the male reproductive system, it it's, becomes a little more complicated since in, in uh, these experiments, both male and female zebra fish were experimentally exposed. 
The findings of reduced egg production and hatching rate could potentially have resulted from effects on either or both sexes. It's unclear whether a male mediated mechanism driving these outcomes in zebrafish would be analogous to something that would occur in mammals, although for what it's worth, there was a mouse study that showed reductions in fertility index and litter size with um, PFNA exposure for 90 days prior to mating with untreated females. Increased levels of serum testosterone uh, were seen in adult male zebrafish exposed to PFNA over 180 days. In contrast, PFNA exposure of male rodents was generally associated with decreased serum testosterone. Although under some experimental conditions, testosterone levels were either unaffected or even elevated. PFNA treated zebrafish showed alterations in gonadal expression of genes related to the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal or HPG axis. While there's some overlap in the markers that were measured in the male gonads of rodents and also in zebrafish, the expression was not always altered in the same direction. PFNA can also bind to transthyretin or TTR, a transport protein that impacts thyroid hormone levels and function. Disruption of the thyroid hormones may in turn contribute to male reproductive effects. A finding of increased TTR transcription in, in treated zebrafish could reflect induction due to competitive binding of PFNA. In these same treated zebrafish, plasma thyroid hormone levels were significantly higher than controls, contrasting with rodent results, which tended to show reduced thyroid hormone levels with PFNA exposure. The authors of the zebrafish study proposed that PFNA could act to induce TTR transcription across species, while at the same time resulting in opposite effects on, on the more downstream uh, effects on thyroid hormone levels in zebrafish versus rats. So over all these inconsistencies between the zebrafish and rodent data could be related to species differences or to other aspects of experimental procedures, such as dose timing of exposure and so on. You know, just there's more work to be done to fully understand. Now, uh, next slide, please. Uh, with with PFDA exposure of male zebrafish, effects included an increased plasma estradiol to testosterone ratio, as well as increased plasma estradiol to 11 keto testosterone ratio. PFDA exposed male zebrafish also showed a dose dependent increase in gonadal expression of the aromatase gene. Aromatase is a steroidogenic enzyme which may affect the conversion rate of testosterone to estradiol. Vitaligenin is an egg yolk precursor protein. Increased blood levels serve as a biomarker in both male and female vertebrates for exposure to environmental estrogens. In this case, the zebrafish data were consistent with other uh, evidence suggesting involvement of effects on the HPG access in PFDA mediated male reproductive toxicity. Next slide. Just to uh, go over th the potential increase in the use of zebrafish for evaluating toxicity, we just wanted to note that in recent years, both the US and the European Union have been making commitments to reduce the use of mammalian test species for uh, purposes of em environmental health, testing for environmental health. Uh, USB EPA released a memorandum in 2019 stating their intent to reduce requests for and funding of mammalian toxicology studies by 30%, no later than the year 2025. Further reductions to, uh, to effectively zero requests and funding is targeted for 2035. Uh, the EU currently prohibits completely animal testing for cosmetic products or ingredients as of 2013. The EU is also currently developing plans to phase out the use of animals in research and testing for purposes of environmental health assessment. Zebrafish are increasingly becoming the go-to whole animal alternative to mammalian test species as the understanding of the comparative biology and 
and as well as validation of the use of zebrafish as a relevant model have been rapidly increasing in, in recent years. Fish, of course, are animals, and there are guidelines for ensuring consideration of their welfare that have been published. The Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare from the US Public Health Service interprets aquatic species as live vertebrate animals, at the time of hatching for zebrafish, this is approximately 72 hours post fertilization. The EU uh, uses as their guidance commencement of independent feeding by zebrafish larvae, which occurs at about 120 hours post fertilization point. And for, that, for their guidelines, that's a point at which the welfare regulations start to apply. Last slide, please. Pancho, next slide. Oh, there they are. Okay, sorry. Um, as for today's presentation, uh, we're, we're going to be learning uh, about aspects that are generally covered by these four topics. Comparative reproductive and developmental biology of zebrafish. Zebrafish is a model for large scale screening for potential dart hazard and risk. Zebrafish is an experimental model for investigating development at the cellular and zebrafish is a experimental model for investigating development at the molecular level. And that concludes my presentation for this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Are there any questions for Dr. Campbell before we move on? If I may, actually, I, I do have a couple of questions. I was wondering, <laughs> When when you build the hazard identification document um, and you you review the literature available, um, what kind of criteria do you use for inclusion or exclusion of, of zebrafish data? Is it different from other mammalian data? And then it's a two-parter question. Related to that, um, basically, do we need to build an expertise in non-mammalian model if if that does not exist already on the, on the staff side to really accurately review that kind of literature? Um, I, it depends, I think, on whether it, uh, you know, it fits the toxicity data the same way we would use mammalian data, then we would fold that zebrafish data in there. In other cases where it's more mechanistic data, that's a little bit more, it's harder to predict. We just have to kind of see where things go and what we find. I don't know if that fully answers your, your question. And I don't know if anybody else from the staff would want to comment. Pancha, you're muted. We still can't hear you. Okay, thank you. Sorry, <laughs> I have a uh, second backup mute button. Sorry about that. Yeah, you're right, Melissa. So we don't, Dr. Allard, we don't make any special uh, adjustment for our literature search uh, according to uh, zebrafish or other uh, uh, mammalian uh, models. Uh, we base our findings on on what is relevant to reproductive and developmental, and it could be a final effect or it could be mechanistic effect on zebra fish as in any other animal species. So we don't make a difference at this point. Uh, so I hope that helped. Thank, Thank you. you. I see Diana has a question. Diana? Diana, you have your hand raised, but you're muted. Okay, maybe that was not a real hand raised. Um, okay, well, I am pleased, thank you, Dr. Campbell, and I'm pleased to uh, welcome the real chair of this meeting, <laughs> Dr. Litter, who will be taking over the duties from now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Allard, for um, stepping in. I really appreciate that. Um, so uh, let me, um, just get situated here. So our um, 
next um, we're going to, I believe, um, switch to part one, uh, zebrafish biology and suitability for toxicity screening. And um, this, uh, our first speaker I'm delighted to introduce is Dr. Bruce Draper of the University of California, Davis. Uh, and our second speaker will be Dr. Stephanie Padilla of the US EPA. Uh, after these presentations, we'll have 30 minutes for committee discussion with Drs. Draper and Padilla. So to introduce Dr. Bruce Draper, he's Professor of Molecular and Cellular Biology at the University of California, Davis. Dr. Draper's research uses a combination of gene knockout and single cell transcriptomics to identify genes required for zebrafish gonad development and function and sex determination and differentiation. So our first presentation by Dr. Draper will be comparison of zebrafish sex determination and reproductive and developmental biology to humans, as well as mammalian test species. And um, welcome, uh, Dr. Draper. It's a pleasure to uh, have you here. Well, thank you very much. And it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. All right, so I've been tasked with giving a sort of general overview of zebrafish biology. Um, uh, early development and what is my field of study, um, reproductive biology. I'm going to divide this talk into sort of three general areas. Um, the first is going to be the general overview of zebrafish development and their and and um, aspects of that development that make them advantageous for toxicant screening. Uh, I'll then give a, a quick comparison of zebrafish to humans and other vertebrates. And then finally, I'll end with an overview of zebrafish reproductive biology, including sex determination and how it compares to mammalian species. Let me get my laser pointer going here. Oop, that didn't work. Okay. This is an overview of zebrafish early development. Um, on the outside are some, some nice illustrations of the different embryonic stages. And on the inside of this diagram are the time scales in which these occur. One of the major advantages of zebrafish over, for example, mice for, um, for developmental studies, as well as using them for toxicant screening, is that all aspects of early development happen outside of the mother as opposed to in utero in the mouse. Zebrafish, um, when we set them up to mate, um, they're programmed to spawn in the when the sun rises and in our fish facilities, that's when the lights come on, generally around eight or nine o'clock in the morning. And a single female can spawn hundreds of eggs that will then um, relatively synchronously develop. So fertilization happens um, uh, outside the mom, and then they go through these rapid cleavage stages. Um, and at about six hours post fertilization is when they initiate gastrulation, which is going to create the three germ layers, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, from which all of our organs are derived. Um, gastrulation is complete by about 10 hours post fertilization. And at that stage, we enter into somatogenesis. And already at this stage, um, you can start to make out the basic vertebrate body plan, where in the anterior, you have the head and the developing brain. Um, and in the posterior, you have the developing somites, which give rise to um, the musculature and um, bone structure of the fish. Uh, by 24 hours post fertilization, this uh, fish has the basic vertebrate body plan, and many of the organs have already, um, the primordia of these organs have already uh, been set aside and patterned, and in some cases have already started to function. By three days post-fertilization is when the, um, the larvae hatch and become free swimming, and then by five days is when they can actually start feeding. The entire life cycle from fertilization to becoming a reproductive adult can take anywhere from two months to three months, depending upon um, how well they are fed during the, the, this time period and, and, and issues like crowding. Um, so about the earliest you can get them to go through one cycle is two months. But in general, um, I think in, in many of our facilities, um, it takes about three months. So in that aspect, the reproductive cycle is about similar to the, the mouse. 
Um, but importantly, because all of these stages happen externally, um, you can basically apply any toxicant to test their effects on various aspects of development, whether it be early development, um, uh, effects on, on the morphogenesis movements that are required for gastrulation, um, and also uh, as um, larva, juveniles, and adults. A typical um, fish facility or zebrafish facility looks look something like this. These are manufactured facilities from, from any number of companies. Um, but the main point here is that we can raise very large numbers in a fairly small footprint. My facility at UC Davis is about a 450 square foot facility, and we have an average census between 15 and 25,000 adult fish in this facility. Um, and this is relatively cheap to maintain relative to mammalian species. Um, another aspect which uh, is important is that um, if you keep the proper light cycle for zebrafish, they will breed year round so we can get um, embryos on any day that we um, want to get them and we can get them in the thousands if necessary for, for high throughput screening, which I think you'll hear more about from the other um, panelists. One reason why zebrafish was chosen for biomedical studies in the beginning um, was that their embryos are relatively transparent. So this is a, a picture of a 24 hour old embryo. And just with a dissecting microscope, you can actually make out very, various um, developing uh, tissues in the, the fish. For example, if you look here in the head, um, you can make out the forebrain, the hind brain, the midbrain and the hindbrain. You can make out a developing ear, um, eyes. By about a day and a half, the heart is functional and begins to beat and you can follow you know, blood flowing through the, the various vessels. Um, posteriorly, um, you can see a notochord, this transient structure, which is a transient structure, um, which makes us chordates, um, and the neural tube, and then the, the musculature. So this is just in a light microscope, but um, we can combine this with transgenesis and create animals that actually express the green fluorescent protein in various um, specific tissues or cell types. Uh, this particular one is um, expressing the green fluorescent protein in all the blood vessels of the embryo. And so you can combine this with toxicant screening to get a more refined um, view or, or, or to, to really um, hone in on a particular tissue type that you're interested in. Um, so maybe this wouldn't be used for a primary screen, but for um, secondary screens to look at more mechan me mechanistic studies. Um, this is just one of many uh, cell type specific transgenics that are available in zebrafish. So some other advantages of using zebrafish, um, I've already mentioned that they have the basic vertebrate body plan, which is similar to, um, to, to mammal, mammals, including humans. There is a molecular conservation of the genes that regulate development with other vertebrates. Um, they're very easy to maintain in the lab. They were, you know, one of the reasons they were also chosen is because they're a very robust um, fish species. Um, and, and that also leads to them being relatively inexpensive relative to mammalian species. Uh, we can get large numbers of embryos at any time that we want for doing large scale, scale screens, um, which is also uh, made easier by their external development. They're optically clear, um, amenable to high throughput screens, and um, the molecular and cellular conservation of the reproductive organs, which I'll get to, which is you know, part of what this committee is tasked to, to look at. So to do a, a more direct comparison between the genes that regulate development and reproduction in zebrafish relative to humans, um, the entire genome sequences are known for, for both humans and zebrafish, so we can really do a, a direct comparison of gene orthologs between the two. And 70% um, of the genes that are required that are found in humans are orthologs are also found in zebrafish. And in fact, 80% of the genes that have already been associated with human disease um, also have orthologs in zebrafish. 
Uh, zebrafish have livers, pancreas, gallbladder, a circulatory system, um, an analogous digestive system. Uh, they all obviously don't have lungs because they are they are aquatic species, but they do have um, a structure called a swim bladder, um, which has a similar developmental um, origin and as well as the central nervous system. And I'll just um, emphasize the fact that they have a liver um, is important also for toxicant screening because the liver has many enzymes that can convert toxicants into other um, derivatives. Um, and so you wouldn't have this um, this contribution if you were doing, for example, cell culture type screening for toxicants. I want to spend a brief um, moment on talking about the evolutionary um, history of zebrafish relative to humans to point out um, mainly the numbers of genes that zebrafish have relative to humans. So there's um, one main branch in vertebrate evolution. The branch that gave rise to us is what is called the lobed fin fishes branch. Um, and one of the species that is still um, alive today is the coelacanth, which is a uh, precursor to, uh, which is a lobed finned fish. Um, the other major branch is called the ray finned fishes, and that's where zebrafish is a part of. Um, two thirds of all uh, living vertebrates are in the ray finned fish lineage, um, one third in the lobed finned fish. The other fishes that I put on here um, are here mainly because these are. Um, animals that we have whole genome sequence for, so they can be used to really um, allow us to do very careful analysis of gene orthology um, when we go from zebrafish to humans. Um, now, these arrows back here are looking at uh, genomic events that happen during the course of vertebrate evolution, which were important for evolution, and what are called whole genome duplication events. So predating the split between the lobed fin and the ray fin fishes, there were two whole genome duplication events that took, for example, a gene that might be present as a single copy in uh, Drosophila, which is another, you know, fruit flies, which is another um, important species for, um, for biomedical research. Uh, humans would have four copies of that gene because the first genome duplication went from one to two copies. The second genome duplication went from two to four. Now, after the split um, and a little bit farther down, the Telios lineage underwent an additional whole genome duplication. Now, Telios, is in particular zebrafish, are a diploid species, but in comparison to humans, um, in some instances where humans have a single copy gene, zebrafish would have two copies of that gene. And it's about 25 to 30 percent of the gene orthologs between humans and zebrafish actually have a, a duplicated copy in zebrafish relative to humans. So this is important when comparing, when comparing um, gene function and gene orthology between um, mammalians and fish species. Now, I, this is a, um, I gave a talk to the, the staff uh, of DART a, a couple of months ago, and one of the questions that came up was, how do you compare zebrafish lines relative to mouse lines? Um, in particular, how inbred are they? So mouse lines are typically very inbred and are very homozygous at most loci. Um, zebrafish lines um, are not as inbred. These lines, um, for example, this is not in an an exhaustive list of the various lines that zebra that people use for zebrafish, but three of the main ones that are used um, across the world are the AB line, which was derived at the University of Oregon, where zebrafish really um, got its start as a genetic um, system for studying vertebrate development. Um, the other uh, main line was developed um, at the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen called the TU line. Both of these were pet store derived and they were put through a genetic bottleneck because the point of developing these lines for these two um, institutions was to make lines that were essentially lethal free that did not have any heterozygous lethal mutations because what they wanted to do was to use them for forward genetic screens. So they were bottlenecked. Um, clonal lines have been produced, but they are um, typically much less 
robust and fecund than the non-clonal lines. So it's more practical to maintain the non-clonal lines for these studies. Um, but at least for the, the University of Oregon line, it's been estimated that they are about 70% homozygous, but there is you know, that 30% diversity um, that we try to maintain when, when maintaining these stocks to keep these very robust lines. Okay. Getting towards kind of more the reproductive biology, um, zebrafish are sexually dimorphic. They're very subtle differences, but to the, the trained eye, you can start to pick these out pretty quickly. Um, so what I'm showing here is various views of a female zebrafish on the top and a male zebrafish on the bottom. Um, female zebrafish are in general a little bit larger than males, um, a little bit wider, and you'll see on the, the next slide that that's because they have a very large um, ovary relative to the testis size in males. So a lot of times you can determine their sex just based on their overall um, body morphology. Uh, zebrafish have three different um, pigment types that make up these stripes. One of them um, called the xanthophor or, uh, xanthophores is this yellow pigment stripe here in between the, the two dark pigment stripes. Females, um, this pigment is a little bit less saturated, so they don't look as yellows as the, as the males do. Um, so that's one way that it's easy to tell males from females is, is the males look more yellow. Um, there are also other secondary sexual characteristics, for example, the genital papilla, which is where the eggs are released from um, relative to where the, the sperm is released. Um, back here, the genital papilla is kind of the swollen structure in females, whereas in males, um, you don't really see it. It's just like a, a little flat structure um, over the pores. So, um, so we can also use these to determine the sex of the fish. Now, um, going back to the internal organs, um, here we've just dissected off the, the skin um, from the fish so we can look inside and compare, in particular, the size of the ovary versus the size of the testis. Um, so these are just light microscope pictures on the top, but these animals are also transgenic for a transgene that drives the green fluorescent protein expression in all germ cells. And so if we switch to the fluorescent channel, we can see um, that this is where the, the germ cells um, are you know, brightly fluorescent in the ovary, and you, it's a little bit fainter fluorescence um, in the testis there. Now, one main difference in reproductive biology between um, female zebrafish and, um, mammal and mammals is that in mammals, all germ cell proliferation and production of oocytes happens in utero. Females are born with their germ cells arrested in prophase of meiosis one, and there are no new oocytes added for the remainder of the life of the individual. By contrast, um, most of the fish species that have been looked at, and in particular zebrafish, have the capacity of producing new oocytes throughout their life because like males of almost all species, they possess a specialized cell type called um, stem cells, in, in particular oogonial stem cells. And you can't see them in this picture, you would have to look at a higher magnification, but this is um, where they localize in the ovary. And these cells um, are capable of mitotic divisions to create new cells that can enter meiosis and become oocytes. And so if you do a histological section through a zebrafish ovary, which is what this picture is, um, and stained with, this is a H and E stain section, you can find oocytes at all stages of development from the early stages, like stage 1b, um, all the way to later stage oocytes that are um, starting to take up phytelogenin from the blood, what are called the phytelogenic stage, um, stage 3 oocytes, all the way through to the mature eggs, which is not shown here. So if you are interested in studying toxicants that are affecting the early aspects of female reproductive biology, in mice, you would have to treat mothers that have female embryos to affect their germ cells, whereas in zebrafish, you can just um, uh, treat adult females with these compounds because they are constantly producing new oocytes. So that's another um, advantage because of the reproductive biology of zebrafish. Uh, 
I want to give an overview of zebrafish um, reproductive organ development, and then we'll turn to sex determination to give you a, a reference for the timing at which these are happening during zebrafish development. So on top is a typical vertebrate um, timeline for in developmental stages for development of the ovary versus the testis. I'll start back here at the during embryogenesis for both species for 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 um, for mammals um, and zebrafish. Uh, there are somatic gonad precursors that are set aside, as well as the precursors to the germ cells called primordial germ cells, and these are um, one of the first cell types to be set aside during embryogenesis. The sites of somatic gonad development and early germ cell development are at different locations in the embryo, so the first thing that has to happen is the germ cells need to migrate to where the somatic gonad is going to form. Once they have reached that site, we call this initiation of gonad development. And then in both mammals and in zebrafish, um, there is a stage where the gonad is what we call bipotential. If you compare gene expression between the um, somatic cells of a what will be a male versus a female, there are no differences. So early gonad development um, is identical in males versus females. But once sex has been determined, then the bipotential gonad in females switches to a trajectory that will um, lead it to developing female-specific cell types um, of the ovary, whereas in the male, um, it will switch over to producing male-specific cell types to make up the testis. So this is what we call um, sex differentiation, and in between here is sex determination. So both mammals and zebrafish go through these same developmental stages. They just um, uh, happen at different times. So in zebrafish, in particular, this specification stage happens during the first about 10 hours of development. And then for the next five days of development, um, not much happens, but around eight days of development, um, we start seeing a lot of proliferation of both the somatic gonad and the germ cells in the stage, which is called the bipotential stage. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about this on a, on a subsequent slide. The bipotential stage of gonad development, as far as we can tell, um, happens is basically between about eight to 20 days of development by which time sex has been determined. And then starting around 20 days of development, we can actually, um, with appropriate markers, start to see differences between what is going to develop into an ovary versus what is going to develop into a testis. So that happens about 20 days post-fertilization. So again, as just to, re to, to emphasize um, this, this timeline and also when we can first tell the differences between ovaries versus testis, Back here in the bipotential stage is actually when we start to see the first signs that germ cells are starting to differentiate. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about this in a, in, a, in a second. So we can start to see evidence of the first meioses around 14 days post-fertilization. So the specialized cell cycle that's required for the production of gametes. And then between 20 and 30 days post-fertilization is when we see the somatic gonad and sexual differences. So um, at 30 days, we can absolutely, with appropriate markers, either by dissecting the gonads out or what's shown down here is that same transgenic, which expresses the green fluorescent protein and germ cells, we can look in living fish um, until an animal that's going to develop as a male versus a female based on the sheer size of the, of the gonad where the testis is very thin and faintly um, staining um, while the ovary has already um, grown quite large relative to the size of the fish. And we can, at this stage, with almost 99% certainty if we sort fish that have this fluorescence versus this, these animals were developed as females versus males. So females versus males begs the question of what determines whether you have females versus males. And so one of the questions that came up um, in our, our previous meeting was, are the sex ratios um, outcomes that, like, is sex ratio an outcome that typically is or could be evaluated in a DART study using zebrafish? Um, 
in mammals, because it's chromosomal sex determination, XX versus XY, you get a relative 50-50 ratio. So let's talk about how what we know about how sex is determined in zebrafish. So I'm not going to talk about uh, initially how sex is determined in the domesticated fish, which we use in the line in, in the lab, but I'm going to talk about how sex is what's known about sex determination if you go and collect zebrafish samples from the wilds of India where they are endemic. And so this study was done by John Postwaite and Manfred Chartle. John's at the University of Oregon. And what they did was they did what's called a genome-wide association study. It's not important that you understand how that works, but what they're looking at is, is there a particular chromosome or region of a chromosome which is predictive of sex? And the important thing of this graph down here is on the um, x-axis are the um, 25 chromosomes of zebrafish, and on the y-axis um, is a score for predictiveness of whether a, a chromosomal locus is, is tightly associated with one sex versus the other, as you would expect, for example, the Y chromosome to be in mammalian um, sex determination. And what they found was that on the, um, on the distal end of chromosome four, there was a highly predictive region which segregated specifically with animals that became females. And the females were, were heterozygous for this. And when the females are the what we call the heterogametic sex, so in mammals, XY is the heterogametic sex, XX the homogametic sex. And if we have that situation, then we, then we use the XXXY nomenclature. But if the heterogametic sex is females, we use ZZZW. So the ZW um, chromosomal situation is female, the ZZ is male. So this is the same in birds, actually. So at least in wild zebrafish, there is chromosomal sex determination. But somehow this has been lost in the domesticated zebrafish. We do not have any evidence for the lines that I showed you that there is a chromosomal basis of sex determination. And in fact, sometimes we can get fairly skewed sex ratios you know, 90% males versus 10% females or vice versa, that in general, in, under standard laboratory conditions, we are somewhere in the 50-50 sex ratio region. So if it's not chromosomal, what do we know about the um, mechanism of sex determination? So I'm going to apologize for this slide. It looks quite complicated, but I'm going to walk you through it. Um, what I'm showing here are some simple diagrams of different cell types in the zebrafish gonad. On the right here are the germ cells going from the mitotic um, germ cells, which we in, in the larva, which we can call gonocytes, and their um, early meiotic products. On the left is a representation of the somatic gonad cell types. During the bipotential stage, it truly is bipotential if you look at genes that are eventually will be expressed in males versus females, we find a salt and pepper mixture of the expression of those genes in the bipotential gonad. So this is prior to sex determination. So an example of that would be CYP19A1A, which includes the aromatase that Marilissa um, referred to um, earlier. This is involved in estrogen synthesis. We can find cells that are expressing that um, and this is a female-specific gene eventually, whereas there are male-specific genes such as SOX9A or the anti-malarian hormone, um, which would be expressed also in cells that are um, adjacent to CYP19. So there's really the salt and pepper mixture. What we know is that if you completely get rid of germ cells, there's various techniques for doing that, for completely ablating the germ cell component of the gonad. 100% of those animals will grow up and be phenotypically male. They will look like males and they will behave like males, but they will be sterile. So that suggests that germ cells are playing an essential role in female development. And based on what we know, it is that um, one thing I, I haven't mentioned yet, which is a quirk of zebrafish, in that 100% of animals initially start to produce early stage oocytes, even animals that will become male. But what happens is, is that 
what we believe is, is that there is a threshold number of oocytes that need to be produced because the oocytes are producing a cell signaling molecule, which signals to the somatic gonad to stabilize female gene expression. And so if you can reach this threshold number of oocytes and therefore this signal, you will stabilize female development and those animals would become female. If you do not reach that threshold, the oocytes will eventually die as the somatic portion of the gonad transitions to a testis and you start producing sperm. Not only is this signal required for primary sex determination, but even we have evidence that even as an adult, you require constant signaling from germ cells, in particular oocytes, to the somatic gonad. And if there's anything that prevents the production, the continuous production of oocytes, we can actually have a, a female that initially develops as female producing oocytes will sex reverse and become a male. And in some situations and some tricks we can do, we can get those males to actually be fully um, fertile and they behave like males. So there's this constant signaling that has to occur. So any toxicant that prevents either this early signal or perhaps um, prevents this later signal will lead to either an overproduction of males versus females or cause animals that started off as females to sex reverse and become males. So while this is kind of a quirk of zebrafish, we can leverage it to, um, you know, fairly, to do fairly high throughput screens looking for toxicants that skew the sex ratio relative to the controls. So this is really a cellular view of sex determination. What about the, the comparisons of genetic sex determination between fish and mammals? Um, and this is just a slide showing you some key genes in mammalian sex determination, and then I'll compare that to, um, to zebrafish. So up here at the bipotential stage, um, all gonads um, sort of equally produce these two cell signaling molecules. It's not really important what they are. One's red, one's blue. Um, in mammalian males, because they have a Y chromosome, they have a transcription factor called SRY, which is kickstarts the entire sex determination process. If you have SRY, you are a male. If you lack it, you become female. SRY then um, leads to the upregulation of this um, FGF9 gene, the red gene up here, which inhibits the blue gene WENT4. So in this situation, um, FGF9 wins out because of the help of SRY, and then we turn on downstream genes, which are important for sexual differentiation, one of which is this gene called DMRT1. If you lack SRY, if you're XY or XX, um, then WENT4 is, um, is set to win out over FGF9, and then you turn on the downstream um, female-specific transcription factors, um, for example, FOXL2, which lead to sex differentiation. So how does this compare to zebrafish? Um, well, zebrafish do not have orthologs of SRY, this uh, mammalian-specific gene, nor do they have orth orthologs of um, FGF9. By contrast, they do have orthologs of WENT4, FOXL2, and DMRT1. On the next slide, this is essentially the same information, but I've stripped out now and showing you a direct comparison of mammals versus zebrafish. And what I really want to emphasize is, is that at this level down here, these transcription factors, which are really driving the genes that are required for sex differentiation, turning on the genes likely that are required for hormone production, secondary sexual characteristics. This is highly conserved in all vertebrates. And in fact, DMRT1 is an ancient um, gene that, it, that even is regulating sexual differences um, in most metazoans. For example, it was first discovered in, in Drosophila, the fruit fly, and it also functions in nematodes. So this is a very highly conserved level of, um, of sex differentiation. How these get turned on is not known in zebrafish, um, but once they are turned on, they're doing very analogous um, functions in mammals and fish. And so um, 
to wrap up the reproductive um, biology part, we uh, there was already reference to this in Marlissa's introduction, and I just want to um, kind of close uh, this part with looking at the various hormones versus receptors that are required for um, for female versus male sex, and what are similarities and differences um, between mammals and zebrafish. So if we look at the females, um, the bioactive, most bioactive hormone for females is the same in both mammals and zebrafish, um, essentially 17 beta estradiol, also called E2. Um, so exactly the same. And in fact, the receptors, um, the orthologs for the receptors that that um, bind to the hormone and regulate gene expression. Um, there are orthologs of, um, of estrogen receptor one and two in zebrafish, but zebrafish has a single copy of estrogen receptor one. It's got a duplicate due to that whole genome duplication of estrogen receptor um, two called 2A and 2B. Now turning to males, um, here's where we see some differences. Um, the most bioactive form of testosterone in mammals is 5-alpha-dihydroxytestosterone, whereas that in fish is 11-ketotestosterone. Now, these are derivatives of testosterone, but they're slightly different. Regardless, they both function through the androgen receptor, which are both single copies in um, mammals and zebrafish. So although there are slight differences in the testosterone, they're still functioning through the same, um, uh, same androgen receptor. Now, finally, um, you'll hear more about this, I think, from Dan, um, Dr. Dan Wagner's talk using single cell um, transcriptomics and omics for analyzing at cellular resolution um, gene expression in the gonads of zebrafish and being able to compare that to mammals. Um, my lab has recently done a single cell RNA-seq study. The only thing important to understand here is that each of these dots represents a single cell from an, a zebrafish ovary and the dots that are we're comparing the genes that are expressed in these cells and so the, the the dots that are most close together have a more similar gene expression pattern but we've been able to identify um, all of the major cell types and cell subtypes in the ovary and compare them to um, to their counterparts in in mammals and i just want to end with saying that there are more similarities than differences between the cell types in the zebrafish ovary and mammals um, the follicle cells which which are the main producers of, of the the um the estrogen for example and the theca cells which produce the precursors to that and so this type of study, you know, using this to also um, look at gene expression changes upon toxicant um, treatment, I think is going to be incredibly powerful. I think we're going to learn, hear more about that um, later today. So just to, um, to wrap this up, when we're talking about the time points that we, if we want to look at developmental toxicity versus reproductive toxicity of particular compounds, you know, when are the optimum times for using zebrafish? So for developmental toxicity, that would be basically between the zero to five days post-fertilization, because that's when the major events of development are happening, um, organ production, um, et cetera. Whereas reproductive toxicity um, treatments should really start on or after 10 days post-fertilization because there's not much going on with the development of the gonads until after 10 days post-fertilization. But basically anytime, um, you know, even throughout adulthood, zebrafish can be used for screening for reproductive toxicants. And so I would just like to end that there are more similarities than differences, I think, in between zebrafish and humans, and therefore they, they really do um, uh, give us a, a good platform for doing um, screening for reproductive and developmental toxicants. And with that, I will end, and um, I don't know if we're gonna take questions now or wait until um, the next talk. Um, okay, I think um, what we have time for now is some clarifying questions um, from committee members, so about five minutes. So please, um, I'm gonna ask the committee members, I already see some raised hands, so I'll start uh, from the top left of my screen. So um, Dr. hertz Pisiotto. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, really intriguing, uh, Bruce. Uh, um, 
to see this um, coming as an epidemiologist here. Uh, I just have a question about um, in the early embryonic stage, um, humans undergo a, a, a almost total or massive demethylation of the of the genome. And I just wondered if there's any data on on that in the zebrafish. Yeah, so um, so there's not as much, um, so there's no like uh, paternally versus maternally inherited um, epigen epigenetic states um, in zebrafish. Uh, you know, basically because there are no sex chromosomes, they really can, we can push them to, to become male versus female and we don't see any differences in um, like imprinting like you would in, in, um, in other species or mammalian species. Uh, so um, to my knowledge, there's not a, you know, large scale um, uh, erasure and then reestablishment of the, the um, epigenome, though that does happen during germ cell development, just as it does in, in mammals. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, Dr. Um, Pessa, I see that you have your hand raised too. Hi, Bruce. Thank you for a Hi, really helpful talk. Um, I was wondering, do you want to comment on sort of the challenges of having external development, the Korean providing a barrier to actually getting chemicals where they would be in mammalian systems and uh, decorionation and how that might influence everything. So yeah, so what, what Isaac's referring to is that the, the zebrafish have essentially what is, you know, an eggshell, which is very impermeable um, to a lot of chemicals. However, you can either manually remove that or there's actually an enzyme called pronase that you can treat, you know, in mass the embryos to digest off that chorion. Um, one of the problems with not having a chorion during the first 10 hours of development is that the um, prior to the end of gastrulation is that the animals are very, um, very fragile, but you can, so if you just put them in like uh, standard tissue culture dishes or 96 well, you know, plastic dishes, um, they can um, lice when they hit the plastic, but there are workarounds with that. You just have to put a thin layer of agarose coating the dishes so that um, so that when they hit that plastic, they don't lice. So there are workarounds um, with that, but it, uh, it is a, a little bit of a challenge um, up until the Corian does not um, normally they don't hatch out until about three days of development. So, so doing the earlier studies, if you want to study things that aren't going to pass the chorion, you have to, um, to remove the chorion, but it can be done. Okay, thank you. Dr. Baskin? Um, yes, that, thank you. Uh, outstanding uh, presentation and this question maybe for a future speaker and or Dr. Campbell, kind of for my own edification, how are you measuring, uh, I think it was an actually Dr. Campbell's talk, but alluded to in this talk, um, plasma levels of, for example, the reproductive hormones in the zebrafish? Yeah, so that, that's something that we don't routinely do, but it's my understanding there are um, uh, ELISA-based kits um, though it, it, it's a sensitivity issue, there um, those kits are not all that sensitive, and maybe Marlissa has a better uh, a better answer for that. I mean, there are very sophisticated kind of metabolomics approaches that you can use that are much more expensive, um, but there are um, ELISA-based kits for measuring hormone levels. But I, I what I don't know is really um, how fine-tuned you can get those for looking at small differences. You know, I don't remember that detail off the top of my head. I'd have to go back and look at the original paper, but I can do that maybe at lunch. And I mean, an my question for is you. That, are you essentially grinding up the, the zebra? That fish? would be my guess, but I, I don't remember the, the details of the methodology. For, for the for the embryos, you absolutely would have to do that because you can't, there's not enough blood to, um, to do it. But for the adults, you can get enough blood to um, to look at, at plasma levels, is my understanding. Thank you. 
but you know, a lot of times they're they're looking at testosterone um, and not the 11 keto testosterone, um, and and how testosterone and 11 keto testosterone levels really correlate with each other. But I, I think they're they're fairly closely correlated. Um, but but generally, most people are looking at testosterone because there's not uh, kits for the 11 keto. Dr. Woodruff? Yes, thank you. That was really excellent presentation. Um, you want to follow up on the question about the transfer across the Corian? Have people done measurements outside and inside for varying type, different types of chemicals to confirm that it's completely, as you're saying, not penetrable? So um, I, I should have mentioned this before. I am not a toxicologist. <laughs> Oh. I am a developmental biologist, so so <laughs> I, I, I think biologist. those so I think those those things have been done. Um, but uh -huh. I'm going to punt, and and it looks like Stephanie wants to um, address that. Let's let's get a card carrying toxicologist here. <laughs> That's fine, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so I was um, I do have a lot of strong opinions about the Corian. It is oh. um, it is a membrane, but it actually has pores in it. And the yeah. pores are large enough for most molecules, most molecules, drug or toxicant molecules, even, even some of the very large uh, herbicide molecules can, can go through the pores. And it is my experience that there, is, there are very few molecules that don't go through the, the corium. Right. I mean, there are some that do. And there is a price to pay besides time and energy for removing the corion. There's some very good studies to show that development does change if the corion is not there. And also um, in, for some of the experiments that we've done that if they're decorionated, the, the behavior is different later on. So um, we, you know, we can talk more about that later, but. That, that is really excellent. I really appreciate both of your answers. I mean, just kind of reminded me about this discussion about, you know, in the old days about the placenta and we found that's, that that's exactly really right. wasn't that accurate. Yeah, it is, and I'm not it is. saying, I'm not, it's no judgment, just, just it's like, oh, this is a very interesting component to the whole yeah. exposure piece of this. So I really it's, appreciate your answers. It's more of a sieve than it is <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. I do have um, one question also, which is you were talking about the shift from heterogametic sex determination that's been lost in the laboratory species that are commonly used. So has anyone really kind of tried to trace when that occurred? And that's one question. And the other one is, would you see any potential benefits to using, you know, wild type zebrafish versus the uh, these species or these strains that have lost that sex determination mechanism. Yeah, so, um, so I should also point out that even in the wild strain where there is a high correlation with a particular locus for females, it, they did not find that there was a 100% correlation. So they actually found some females that were ZZ and they found some males that were ZW. So even in the wild, it's not 100% this, you know, what looks like genetic sex determination. So um, the way I think of that, and I, I think others that is, is that the sex termination mechanism, which in general is a very rapidly evolving system in many species, even closely related to fish species have different um, genes that are, that are the primary drivers of sex determination and fish can be ZZZW or XXXY. Um, so it looks like it's either an evolving system in zebrafish or a devolving system. So they're going, you know, towards this more um, rigid chromosomal or away from it. So um, to your second question of, of, about using the um, the wild strains, so the the advantages of the of the laboratory bred strains is they really have been selected for being lethal free. And so if you want to be able to compare. Um, you know, effects and seeing seeing an effect and knowing that that's not some, you know, genetic predisposition, then the domesticated strains, I think, are, are better than the wild strains. Um, the wild strains, I mean, we have some in the lab. They're, they're also, um, in general, they're more temperamental to use. I don't know why that is. They they don't like to breed as, as well as the ones that have been selected for, you know, good breeders. Um, you know, there might be other wild strains that would be, you um, 
good. I don't have as much uh, experience with those. Thank you. Very so so much. hopefully that, that answered your question. Yeah. And thanks again for a really fascinating presentation. Yeah. All right, um, now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our second speaker, Dr. Stephanie Padilla from the US EPA. So Dr. Padilla is a research toxicologist in the US EPA's Center for Computational Toxicology and Exposure. She has extensive experience with the use of zebrafish larvae and large scale screening assays for developmental and neurodevelopmental toxicity. And the title of her presentation is Overview of Zebrafish as a Screen for Developmental Toxicity with examples from our case uh, chemicals as uh, possible. So, uh, Dr. Padilla, welcome. Looking forward to welcome. your presentation. So can you, I'm just curious, can you see my screen? Which screen are you seeing? You're not we're seeing, seeing, we're not seeing presenter view, but we are seeing your screen. Ah, okay. Just a minute. Let me stop the share. Sorry. How about now? No, now we're not, uh, whoops. Yes, now we're seeing your presenter view, perfect. Uh, okay. So thank you all for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And I'm very interested in the discussion as this, as this meeting continues on today. Um, and I also appreciate Dr. Draper's introduction. So some of what I've got on my slides is um, redundant with what he's presented, but um, I will skip over that part so we don't have to have to go through it twice. Um, let's see, just a minute, it is not progressing like it needs to. Okay, all right, there we go. So um, I have a movie up here that I would really like to show because um, we had a nice I, the movie is very impressive with how quickly zebrafish develop. So I started working in developmental toxicity, neurodevelopmental toxicity with rats. And when I started working with zebrafish, it was a wonderful thing because everything happens so quickly. So I'm going to show you this movie. And over here are the hours of development. So this is the first hour of development. This is about the high blastula stage, which is when we usually begin our exposures. It is going through gastrulation now and going through epiboly. And in a few seconds or hours, as the case may be, you're going to see the embryo begin to form on top of what is going to become the yolk. And so the eye is going to appear over here on this left-hand side. And the right-hand side is the tail region. The somites are beginning to form. The eye is beginning. The brain is beginning to form. We're only 14. 14, 15 hours into it, the tail is going to separate here from the yolk. We're about 20, we're about one day into this development. You can begin to see the blood coursing through the, the embryo. You can begin to see the heart starting to beat. These things are um, melanophores, which are sort of like, uh, I guess the best way to say it is they're sort of like the spots on a fawn. Um, they're, they're, designed for camouflage. You can see the eye has already developed. The heart is beating furiously over here at the front of the animal. Um, we're about two and a half days into the development. The jaw is beginning to move forward. You're almost all that was going through organogenesis here. Pretty soon you're going to see things flowing through the digestive system and he, she is going to swim away. And so we're about 85 hours into this. This animal was probably reared at 28 degrees centigrade. So they develop a little bit faster. We rear most of our animals at 26 degrees centigrade. So they develop, we, we actually do our experiments from day zero until day six. And so some of the advantages, and I'm gonna reiterate some of these and sort of emphasize the ones that are important for how we do our research are there's a very rapid development. There's a transparent embryo. Um, the developmental pathways are homologous with many other vertebrates. The genome is easy to manipulate. And for me in toxicology, I was thinking about working with zebrafish mostly as to extrapolate to human 
toxicity, but it is also a great model for extrapolation to other fish and ecotoxicology. So you're able to inform both types of, of toxicological assessments by doing research with, with zebrafish. Um, one of the things that we also do in our laboratory that I'm not gonna talk about is we do functional assessments. We do behavioral assessments to look for developmental neurotoxicity in the animals. So we're able to ask questions of, you know, are they, are they, are they behaving normally as, as the controls are. As mentioned before, the liver has a metabolic capability to both activate and deactivate chemicals. Some really beautiful work that's been done by Dr. Jed Goldstone has shown that they possess, the zebrafish possess um, P450s from many of the same categories that humans do. They have a thyroid axis, they have a stress axis, they have an HPG axis. So they have all the communication pipelines that vertebrates do when they develop. Now, some of the challenges of working with uh, zebrafish models is when you're looking at either development or neurodevelopmental toxicity, if it is difficult to, it is difficult to assign mechanism unless you've, unless you've got a very special test. We just usually know that something has happened. Something abnormal has happened, but we're not too sure why or how. And so you've really got to delve into that. But for me, from a screening context, um, usually we're just looking for, did something bad happen? And then the also something that I'm gonna talk about, I touch on sort of at the end of this, at, at this talk, is talking about, it's difficult to know the internal dosage of the chemical. It's not simple, um, but a lot of progress is being made. So this is, I wanted to go through this. This is sort of our baseline experimental design. So we, we get the embryos on the day of fertilization. We, we usually wash them with a very dilute bleach solution to get rid of any fungi and begin our exposures usually about six hours post-fertilization. And for the data that I'm going to present today, we change that solution every single day. So we renewed that chemical solution every single day until day five. And on that day, we actually wash the chemical out for our assessment on day six, just so we don't have to handle as many toxic chemicals. And also um, we do most of our chemical exposures blinded so we don't know what chemical we're working with. And um, we just consider everything really dangerous. And so when we do this assessment on day six, it requires quite a lot of interaction with the embryo. And so we'd rather not have the chemical around. So on day six, we look at the embryos. This is a human assessment. And we look at the embryos and ask if it's dead or alive. And if it's alive, we ask if it's hatched, because um, there's we have you haven't seen any pictures, but there's a there's a membrane around the, the zebrafish, and it's a I don't know how to describe it. It's not like of course a chicken chicken egg, but it's sort of like a hard jello. It's kind of like the consistency of a jello shot, if that's helpful to anybody. And it does have pores in it. Um, and so we're looking to see if the embryos hatch because there are classes of chemicals that will decrease hatching in the embryos. And if it's hatched, we record it as did not hatch. That is, that is a toxic endpoint at six days. And then if, it's, if it is hatched, we perform a basic malformation assessment, just looking at various aspects, which I'm going to show you on the next slide, that can be abnormal about the developing embryo. And I wanted to show this um, illustration down here, which shows the zebrafish. This is a six-day-old larval zebrafish in a 96-well plate, because it, it gives you an idea of proportion here with regard to how we, you couldn't do these experiments in a 384-well plate but the, the fish is relatively comfortable in a 96 well plate. And so these are the kinds of things that our human assessment is looking at. This is what a normal six day old zebra fish looks like in a well. Um, these are, they're very visually oriented. These are their big, big eyes. They've got ears, the otoliths on either side. You can't really see them very well, but they do have pectoral fins. And of course there's a nice straight nice straight spine there. This is an inflated swim bladder. And this is what an abnormal fish would look like. There's a lot wrong with this fish. It has a curved axis. There's a lot of edema. Um, it has a very small head, has a very small eye. The, the swim bladder is not inflated. So there's a lot, this is a severely abnormal fish. It is like unlikely to, to reach adulthood. And then this is, um, we have some really nice pictures. We have a 
we have a system that is able to pull the fish up into a capillary tube and take, take pictures of the fish. And it gives us a very, very detailed um, view of the fish and how it's developed. And this is, again, a normal six-day-old zebra fish. Um, you can see from the side, the eye, the, the mouth is, is, the jaw has developed normally, the mouth is towards the front. You can see the individual organs here. You can see the liver. You can see the, um, the digestive tract. You can see the heart. And this is the otolith, the ear, and a nice straight spine. And here is one that is, is abnormal, not severely abnormal, but abnormal. And you can see that it's got quite a bit of unabsorbed yolk, which shows, and it's got some pericardial edema here. It's got a small head, the jaw is misshapen. And you go down to even more and more misshapen and dysmorphology in the developing animal. All these were alive, but they were various shapes of malformation. Taking these pictures, this is something that we've just been able to start. Taking these pictures, we're able to enter them into software. It's called freely available fish inspector software that is able to then take measurements of different aspects of the fish. And so we, we are able to not only do human assessments and say whether they look abnormal or normal and how they look normal, abnormal, but we're absolutely ab, ab, now we can take measurements of the fish. And we can ask how big is the pericardial space? How big is the, is the, is the area around the yolk? How big is the swim bladder? And how long is the fish? How big is the eye? All of these are going to be tied into the toxic assessment and whether some dysmorphology has occurred. And so when I was thinking about this presentation, I was thinking about, well, if I was trying to make, if I was trying to use zebrafish for risk assessment, what are the types of questions that I would want to ask about the data? And so these are the ones that I was thinking about. I want, first of all, I want to know how good are the data. And to, to ask that, I would want to know about consistency of the data within a laboratory and consistency over time within a laboratory, and then a consistency among laboratories. And then, of course, you would want to ask, how does it, how does it compare with the mammalian data? And so I'm going to touch on, on all of those. So the first is, how, how consistent are the data within a laboratory? So the laboratory I'm talking about, of course, is my own, because that's the one where I've got the data. And this is um, a couple of chemicals that I know that you all, this first chemical is BPA. And as I said, we do most of our um, assessments blinded to the chemicals, so we only find out what the results are afterwards. And this was the same chemical, but different sources. So oftentimes when we get our chemicals, they'll, they'll put the same chemical in the, in the library chemicals that we're testing from two different sources. And the way that this is arranged is the dose of the chemical, the concentration of the chemical, these animals were all exposed in the chorion by immersion. And this is the concentration of the chemical that was in the water that they were exposed to. And then this is sort of the toxicity index, I guess. We, we sum up our assessments and come up with a number between zero and 100. And anything that scores 100 was, the animal was, was dead, was, it had killed the animal. Anything in between here, basically in the yellow region, scored between 20 and let's say 99, these animals were, were morphogenically not normal. So they either weren't hatched or there was something wrong with them. And the higher the score means more, more things were wrong with them. And the animals that were here in this range were within the control range. And each circle represents an animal. And sometimes there are lots of animals. It's difficult to tell because there's circles on top of circles. And so if you're looking here, as you can see, the increase in the concentration of BPA caused an increase and such that at the highest dosage, there was some death. And here there was one, I think, out of three animals that died, but two were normal. And so this is often what the curve looks like. And then you can calculate an EC50, an effective dose, basically. And for this, for this run of this chemical, it was 55. And for this run of same chemical, but from a different supplier, basically it was 63.1 micromolar. So these are very similar. Um, and if you look at I think I have another one. Yes, chlorpyrifos, one of my favorite chemicals. If you look at chlorpyrifos, it turns out we use chlorpyrifos as an internal control. And so we have lots and lots of our own assessments as well as um, the internal control that was within the library that we tested. 
And you can see here that um, same thing here, that at the lower doses, there tends to be most of the animals are within the control range. As you increase the dose, you see an increase in disc morphology, even going even higher, you see it basically move from dysmorphology into lethality. And that's the kind of that's the kind of curve that you usually see with this. It's a, it's a gross curve, but from it, you can get an EC50. And again, these EC50s, even though the chemical was com, com, two different sources, were very close. Here it's eight, here it's 10. So it's, it's not bad about consistency about um, testing the same chemical from different sources. And how consistent are the data over time? So it turns out that we had tested, we've tested multiple laboratories. We probably tested two or 3,000 chemicals. Um, and this was the same chemical that was three years apart. This is a strobin, this is a, another chemical, and this is triclosan. So we're looking at the EC50s that were done with two different libraries that we tested. And here, the EC50 for azoxystrobin was 2.9, 3.6. So this is very consistent over time. Or Zalin, we had 16 and, and basically 12. Again, very consistent over time. And for triclosan, it was 4.6 and 2.7. So we're seeing, we're seeing consistency, not only between the chemicals, but also over time. And you have, keep in mind, um, those of you that work with zebrafish will, will get this right away, but the population of fish that we were working with are very, was very different three years apart. Now we try to make everything, we, we need to talk about that, but we try to make everything as consistent among our populations as possible, but this also helps us realize that our populations are, we're not, we're not seeing um, a gradual change in the um, sensitivity of the population over time, because these of course were very, were different fish than the ones that I tested three years before. And how consistent are the data among laboratories? And so that's that's a little bit difficult to get at, but it turns out that um, Ducharme et al. published a paper about 10 years ago now, comparing data from many, many different laboratories um, and many, many different studies to, it turns out, our data, which was really nice. And I think the reason they did that is because we, we were one of the few laboratories at that time that had published a, a very large um, survey of, of a large library with regard to um, LD50s and, and dysmorphologies. And so basically what they did was they looked at all the different studies that they had reviewed and they had, they had calculated um, a, a metric that they call loaded that has to do with how toxic the chemical was to the, to the developing zebrafish and realized that those studies had 16 chemicals in common with our study and just tracked how, what, what was the correspondence between the toxicity that we, had that we had published and the toxicity that had been published in other studies. And it was, I felt they had a really nice correlation and I felt that, that it was very encouraging that the data are consistent among laboratories. And in fact, in just comparing our own data and also comparing our dates, looking at data in other papers for chemicals that we've tested, I would say that there is quite a bit of consistency among laboratories with regard to developmental toxicity of chemicals in zebrafish, embryos, and larvae. Um, and then if you look at, can, concordance between or in concordance between mammalian toxicity and zebrafish. So there's some, there's quite a few papers that we can look at for that. But so for this one, this was a paper that was published. They wanted to look at the concordance with regard to four organotin chemicals. And so this chemical, this paper was, uh, they looked at the in vivo developmental toxicity in mammals, and then they looked at the zebrafish developmental toxicity. And here they're looking at the ranking. And so what they see was the ranking of these chemicals was basically the same between mammals and zebrafish. Um, that the dibutyl tin dichloride was the most toxic followed by the dimethyl tin dichloride. The monomethyl tin dichloride trichloride was not toxic in either. Um, mammals or zebrafish. And then they had not tested the monobutyl tin 
trichloride in mammals, but in zebrafish, it was not toxic. So they were they were very heart they were very heartened by the fact that the the ranking of the toxicity of these organotins was the same between the mammal the mammals and the zebrafish. And then in another paper, Kari et al looked at the toxicity of drugs basically in zebrafish versus mammals. This is developmental toxicity, and it was interesting here they did see some concordance. But in general, the zebrafish, if there wasn't a concordance, the zebrafish tended to overestimate the toxicity for the mammals. So, I mean, if, if you have to go one way or the other, you might want to, you might want a sentinel species that is overestimating the toxicity. Um, and then uh, Nisha Sipes and her, her co-workers published a paper looking at the concordance between um, zebrafish studies and um, and mammal, different mammalian studies. And they found the concordance ranked somewhere between 55 and 87, I guess. And so, you know, that doesn't sound too good, but when you compare it in this way, so they, they also compared it in this way, and this is a very interesting um, graphic. They basically looked at the concordance between zebrafish and rabbit, which is the blue, which was about 47%. And then they looked at the concordance of the zebrafish and the rat. And this is both negative and positive concordance with developmental toxicity studies. And they got about a 52% concordance, but then just something to take home, the rat to rabbit concordance was really only 58%. So it's not horribly wonderful, but it's also not terribly bad in the sense that the zebrafish and the rabbit and the zebrafish and the rat is between 47 and 52 percent and the rat and the rabbit is is really two mammalian is only 58 percent so um it's it is in the right ballpark i guess is the best way to say it now most of what i've talked about is hazard and i know most of what you all are interested in is hazard id but I also would like to talk a little bit about exposure considerations in zebrafish because most of the studies that we, we conduct and most of the studies that are in the, in the literature are immersion type of exposure. So you're, you're taking the animal and you're, you're putting the larvae or the embryo into the solution and you know what the concentration of the chemical is in the solution but you do not know what the chemical concentration is in the zebrafish. And sometimes it's a lot less and sometimes it's a lot more. And rarely is it the same concentration that is in the solution. And so it's really important, especially if you want to do a risk characterization, that you understand what the dose is to the zebrafish. And so how can a zebrafish embryo larvae be exposed to the chemical. Well, obviously it's being exposed dermally to the chemical. So the chemical can, can partition into the, into the embryo just like it crosses any type of membranes. It can also partition into the yolk. And then as the zebrafish grows, it absorbs, the embryo grows, it absorbs whatever's in the yolk. And this is something that can happen. And, and the yolk is in general, a more lipophilic type of environment than maybe the embryo is. After about three to four days, the zebrafish can be exposed orally. So the, um, the um, chemical, the zebrafish begins to take gulps of the surrounding solution by about four days post-development. Post you can expose them by injecting the chemical directly into the zebrafish. This is done for some chemicals that don't, aren't absorbed well by the zebrafish, but, but rarely ever, and it's not really applicable in a screening context. And the zebrafish gills don't really develop until about 10 to 14 days. And so if you're exposing an embryo and assess, assessing the larvae, then you're not going to get much exposure at all through the gills, although it's a very efficient way in an adult zebrafish for the exposure to take place. So we do know that the physical chemical characteristics of the zebrafish are, are do determine how much of the chemical is absorbed by the zebrafish. So this is a study that was done 
where our laboratory and also Robin Tangway's laboratory tested basically exactly the same library. Now their, their um, protocol is a bit different from ours. They decorinate, but they only dose once. We don't decorinate, but we do dose every day. We renew the solution every day. So um, we're looking at the distribution of the log P, which is the octanol water partition coefficient in the um, library that we tested. And you can see it was a pretty wide distribution. And now we're looking at the distribution of the, of the chemicals that tested positive, that we saw changes in development. And the red, of course, is the chemicals that, that we saw as positive, and the blue is the ones that, that Oregon State saw as positive. And, and in general, the distribution is the same, um, that chemicals that have a log P below about minus one or above about eight probably are not useful. They're, they're either too hydrophobic or too hydrophilic for testing in an immersion type of, of situation. So that can make a difference with regard to whether you can test the chemical or not. We have also other aspects um, that can affect dose in zebrafish. Uh, you can have whether the chemical is present in the surrounding solution. So. Um, as long as the chemical is there, the zebrafish is probably going to absorb it. But as soon as the chemical is, is not there anymore, basically it is going to be um, depur depurated, it is going to leave, the, of course, the, it's going to reach a new steady state, it's going to leave the fish and, and enter into the solution. Um, as I mentioned before, there can be hepatic activation of the, of the chemical, it can be hepatic deactivation. Um, the age at the time of the exposure determines how much is absorbed by the, sometimes um, it's not only the presence of the chorion or not, but sometimes even if you expose them for the same number of hours, certain, certain number, certain um, developmental, developmental, certain developmental stages can, will tend to absorb or not absorb the chemical. The duration of the exposure is also very important. Some chemicals like ethanol and nicotine will reach steady state in minutes, whereas other chemicals will take days to reach steady state. Also, the chemicals can induce enzymes. And so they, it could be that they induce enzymes that metabolize them, or they could induce um, enzymes that actually pump them out of the cell. But and I don't want to make this sound absolutely horrible. So even though this is very complicated, there's been some real progress in developing models that, that predict what the dose of the chemical is, what the internal dose of the chemical is in zebrafish. And these are some examples of that. And so um, I'd like to thank you all for, for your attention. And I would sort of like to summarize by saying that I think, um, I think Getting consistent results for develop, screening for developmental toxicity in zebrafish is, um, we're not only getting consistent results within a laboratory, but also I think we're getting consistent results among laboratories. And the comparison with the mammalian data so far is, is reassuring. And so I will be glad to consider any questions or comments and just remark that this, this is a t-shirt that I found on Etsy that I thought was really interesting. I haven't ordered one for myself yet, but I might. So, um, but I'll be glad to answer any kind of questions or comments that you all have. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Padilla, for that wonderful presentation. Um, we have some time now for clarifying questions, about five minutes, and then we'll get into our discussion, uh, which for which we have with both Dr. Draper and Dr. Padilla, for which we have 30 minutes uh, okay. allotted. So uh, please again, raise your hands as before for uh, with any clarifying questions. I will try to um, keep an eye out here for everyone. Um, maybe uh, not, uh, Dr. Baskin, go ahead. <clears throat> that was also a fantastic presentation. I feel like uh, I'm at a developmental biology meeting and just learning. Um, the question I have is, and I think I may have just missed this. So, you know, I'm a, pediatric urologist, and I'm kind of focused on genital development. And, and here, uh, Dr. Graper gave some nice, yep. uh, as well as yourself, on kind of sexual differentiation. W what are the major endpoints that the zebrafish community kind of considers 
you know, super important. You know, like I saw the eyes, I saw the cardiac uh, development. Um, I'm kind of seeing, you know, the development of like the tail and the whole fish. It looks like there's kind of a liver there. There's clearly an ovary, which is very, very impressive, you know, compared to the testes, you know, but the general development was was super subtle. Um, I, it's kind of a global question. So we try to do our experiments and finish our experiments by day five, day six. Um, and by at that time, you cannot, you, you can't really tell at all what this is, is this going to be a male or a female? You cannot, you cannot discern that. You can, I mean, the types of endpoints that that most people look at, they they sometimes they look at earlier endpoints and earlier in the development, but at day six. You're mostly looking to see, you know, is has the animal, is it showing a curved spine? Is it showing any kind of edema, either pericardial or, or yolk edema? Have they absorbed their yolk? Um, is the eye, the head, things like that? Is that is that normal? I mean, having looked at thousands of animals that have been treated with chemicals, those it is a very generic type of report out at that point. There's only, I mean, I often say this, there's only just so many ways that uh, the development in the zebrafish can go wrong and it doesn't necessarily tell you about the mechanism. There are a couple of, I think the, there's a couple of chemicals that um, will affect the notochord development. Sometimes you see a wavy notochord. Um, there are some chemicals, as I mentioned before, that affect hatching. Hatching is actually kind of a complicated process, but um, most chemicals just show, show just something went wrong, I guess is the best way. And I, at this point at six days, and I'm not um, a reproductive biologist, I don't think there's any way to tell if the animal has had some sort of misdevelopment with regard to, um, with regard to reproductive organs. Yeah, the, the, the earliest that anyone's ever reported gene expression differences at around 14 days. Yeah. I, th I think that's kind of early, but but that would be where you um, the earliest signs of skewing one direction to the other for male versus female would occur. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ayun Kim has her hand up. Uh, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the wonderful presentation and uh, very detailed. Um, my question is about the hepatic activation and deactivation um, that you mentioned. Um, and I was just wondering how is, has there been a comparison made between, you know, the, whether the, the um, metabolism would be, how similar the metabolism is to that of the mammals? Is that I do know that the P450 complement is very similar to animals, and they have all the same classes that the, that the mammals have. Um, I don't know. I do know that there has been some plans to publish on that. I am not aware of whether it's been published or not, but there was a lot of effort to, to look at the metabolic profile, not necessarily the genetic profile, but the metabolic profile. And, and so far, I mean, just from my own um, from my own experience in, in looking at the chemicals, I do know that um, they are able to activate many of the OP chemicals, many of the OP chemicals, the organophosphate chemicals that require hepatic activation for, for real potency. Um, but I, I don't know, um, I don't know about the other aspects of it, but it is quite similar. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Plopper. Yeah, I just, the thing that concerned me is that this bioactivation that was just brought up, do these animals have um, <clears throat> kidneys and there and a number of other organs that also bioact in mammals? It, how is that addressed with this model? You know, I don't know that anybody has looked at, um, they do have, they do have, they're not, they do have kidney-like organs, I guess. <laughs> yeah, 
They even have gallbladders, which to me, for some reason, seems amazing. But um, so I don't know about the activation potential. I don't know about the metabolic potential of the other organs, but um, they do have a liver that comes online about two days post fertilization. What do they have? Um, what do you want to call them? I'm trying to think now. Uh, how do they absorb oxygen? They absorb oxygen by diffusion for about the first 10 to 14 days. Um, and then their gills come online and they begin to absorb it through their gills. Okay, thank you. Um, I did have a question, which is when you were look, sharing the data about the consistency among labs, um, whether that analysis adjusted for, it sounds like there's two main lab strains and did it make a difference which strain of zebrafish you were exposing to the chemicals? Like did that improve, you know, if you only looked at the same strain, would it improve the consistency? Oh gosh, so that was from many, many different laboratories. Mm -hmm. And so they're all using various strains. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, I don't wanna make this any more complicated than it has to be, but one of the things that happens if you're rearing fish in the laboratories, you go through many, you go through about four generations. You can go through quite a few generations each year. And if you're not careful to outbreed your animals, then your strain is going to become more and more um, sort of institution specific. Mm -hmm. And so even though you say you're working with the same, like I'm working with AB or you're working with WIC, it doesn't mean that it's exactly the same strain. Um, however, um, we have, compared our strain to other strains and find that it is most like the AB strain with regard to behavioral characteristics, not necessarily sensitive to sensitivity to chemicals. But at, you know, when you're comp in, the, in the graphic that I showed where we were comparing our data to OSU data, um, those are probably two vastly different strains, but yet the, 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 the amount, I mean, the, that we, we're picking up many of the same chemicals. So I, I don't know, there has been some research on strain and effect on, on chemicals and there is some difference, but usually you have to think about, is it whether you're gonna call it a hit? In other words, is the chemical toxic to the zebrafish or a what dose? And so in general, calling the chemical a hit is not gonna be as strain specific as the actual sensitivity to the chemical. So um, we handle strain a, a, a bit differently. And we, we do our best to outbreed our animals as much as possible. When we breed, the, each time we have to raise up a new parental um, generation, we take it from all the different ages that we have. At least once a year, we order another completely different strain from someplace and mix it in with ours. And so we try to keep our, we, we've gone towards the randomization aspect of it rather than the specificity aspect of it. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, I'm not seeing any more raised hands unless Dr. Plopper, did you have another question? No, I'm fine. I just didn't lower my hand. Okay. All right. Just wanted to make sure. Okay. So um, now we're going to uh, start with the um, committee discussion, the part one of that, uh, with doctors uh, Draper and Padilla. And so um, we, you know, just to kind of get discussion going, we have um, some questions to think about. Um, and so um, one of those is in setting up an experiment using zebrafish, how many adult fish of each sex would you typically start with as a source of ova and sperm? And either uh, you know, Dr. Draper or Dr. Padilla could, could maybe, um, maybe start um, responding to that. Oops, I think Dr. Uh, Pia, yeah, go ahead. Now we can hear you. Um, in a screening context, we usually start with a with a lot of fish and a lot of embryos. We have group, I don't know, we probably start with 30 or 40 of each sex. Um, and we have multiple ages per, per, 
parental ages that we that we made at the same time, and we take <laughs> samples from from the eggs that were produced by each group of parents. So again, we're we're trying to to basically randomize things as as much as possible. Um, if you if you do a one on one type of mating, you First of all, it's a lot of trouble because you would have to mate a lot in order to get the thousands of embryos you need to start with to set up the screening context. So, um, and, and it's much less successful when you use fewer fish. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's what we would use because we need, we need quite a few embryos at each go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Dr. Draper, did you have any? I, I, I don't have anything that? to add to that. As I, as I said, I, my lab has not done a, you know, classic toxicology screen. Okay, um, I see that uh, um, Dr. Ellard has hand raised. Yeah, I wanted to circle back to that question of compar comparability between laboratories, um, um, both from a toxicity standpoint as well as from a endpoint measurement. So it's about standardization um, of practices across laboratories so that we can really understand differences that may emerge uh, between studies. So the first part of the question is toxicology focused, and that's really relying on this paper uh, from Wendy Boyd is the first author in EHP um, that relied on your data, Dr. Petty, and compared it to the Tangue Labs data. Um, and, and saw a, a, a decent but partial overlap between, between labs. Um, and then in the paper, they sort of talk about, you know, maybe it's the way that the data is analyzed, I think. I mean, I, I guess my question is, where does the difference come from? And then I'll have a second parter for, for both of you after that about standardization about endpoint measurements, but maybe we can start with a toxicological angle. Are you muted? Got it. So um, the data that I showed that compared our data to Tangway Laboratory on that graph with the physio physiochemical characteristics, we analyzed that data the same way. So it's different from the Wendy Boyd paper. So we, we took their data and our data and put it through the same analysis program. And on that one there, we did tend to get more hits and from that, we interpreted it as dosing every day tended to give you more hits than the decorination aspect, because that was really the difference. There, I mean, there was some strain difference, but I, I, I don't think a strain difference would make a difference on whether you called it a hit or not. And that's basically what, what that aspect was. Um, the Wendy Boyd paper, there were differences in the analysis. There was quite a few differences in the analysis when she was comparing those data. Um, and that's why we took it through the same type of analysis paradigm to, to look at it. Um, I, you know, we, we are very concerned about differences in laboratory. And I think, especially for behavioral assessments, but for doing developmental assessments, I have been, I have been participating in OECD work group where we've been looking at developmental and behavioral assessments. And in general, the developmental assessments of the chemicals among the laboratories is much more consistent than the results from the behavioral assessments. So. Okay, that was, that was my question about, um, about a standardization of, of measurements of behavior or other endpoints that often are done in automated ways, but some people sort of design things in-house, some people That's use right. That's right. Uh, sort of commercial platforms. And I was wondering that whether there's been some some uh, common well, agreements I mean, about benchmarks that need to be met for those for those things to be used. Yeah. No, and actually, <laughs> we just finished writing a paper and submitting a paper. Just we had reviewed the literatures, just trying to figure out all the differences in, in approaches, and it's and it's really scary. And this is for behavioral measurements, and it's not only approaches; it's it's reading a paper and trying to figure out what they did. Um, the reporting is is something that we need to get a lot better in order to be able to determine if these two papers did run the assay in the same way or didn't run the assay in the same way. So I completely agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, can I just follow up on that on that question, which is 
I think one of the things that we found when we're doing this is that people compare active inactive, which is not, which can um, skew your comparisons and don't compare like a benchmark dose across assays. Have you done this and compared the difference? Because the benchmark dose tends to be a better reflection of the experimental dose response right, and you right. get better comparability. Yeah, and so the data, have, the data, I think that alludes a little bit to the statistical analysis component of it. Yeah, and so the data that, that I showed with the physiochemical characteristics and, and how well it corresponded was a re, basically, a, I guess, a benchmark dose type of calculation. So it wasn't limited by the doses that were chosen. It wasn't like a low L or something like that. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pessa, you have a question? No, I, I still want to get back to um, this issue of testing compounds at the extremes where, um, you know, many of the persistent organic pollutants that are thought to be developmentally uh, toxic and in particular neurotoxic, um, th they have to be in solution to get past the chlorian. I mean, and I, I found many studies that I've reviewed where the dose response and the EC50, um, or whatever the measurement was at endpoint, were well above the solubility limit of the compounds in aqueous solution. Now, granted, maybe the, the solutions that you're using have uh, components in it that are analogous to serum proteins, which can help the compound get in if the pores are large enough. But could you address that? Because that really speaks to how seriously you should take some of these results. So most people that do the testing do look at the solubility characteristics and, and shouldn't be testing above the solubility of the chemical. Is that, is that I, what I you're saying? A, I just read a paper on benzophenones, which are virtually insoluble in water, and they got all sorts of <laughs> results. Uh, and so I'm, it left me wondering, uh, how do you interpret those results? And they're yeah. not measuring. They're not measuring the the level of the chemical in the animal. They are not. It sounds like it sounds like that would be the the next yeah. question, right? Yeah. How much of it got into the animal? But do many studies actually take the um, the expense of sending off extracts to? Um, I mean, is that routinely done so that one could? Well, no, but that's why they need to work within the solubility characteristics of the chemical, I guess. Um, no, there, there are some. There are some, um, there are some uh, companies that do that, that will test your chemical and also determine because they want to find out if the chemical is negative. This is mostly European, but they want to find out if the chemical causes adverse effects in the developing vertebrate, so they send it. And if it doesn't, then they also need to ascertain that the chemical got into the animal. And um, they, they do that type of analysis. But, and in, eco, in ecotoxicology, they do spend a bit more time looking at whether the chemical is in solution and how much of it is in solution and working below the solubility characteristics of the, it's more so than in, in mammalian hazard ID. But, but no, I think that is, a, I think is a very, a very valid concern. But is there, are there steps being taken to try to get that more standardized in terms of either normalization to internal dose or, you know, having a factor that you use in if, uh, you know, you try. Well, to I mean, as, as sort of what I was talking about towards the end is there, there are people that are developing models that should be able to at least do a pretty good job of predicting how much of the chemical, how, what is the bioconcentration factor? How much of the chemical is in the, in the embryo after a certain time, after a certain type of exposure? That's important. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a kind of a, another aspect we can turn to to discuss in, to, in our discussion, which is, 
you know, whether, and I think you, you mentioned this a little bit, Dr. Padilla, but I think we can have more discussion about it, whether the potential parental contribution is considered in study design or data analysis. And you mentioned that you really try to randomize um, that when you're doing these high throughput screens. Um, but, you know, how, you know, or do other, you know, and perhaps do other groups and kind of getting into what is sort of the common practice potential, um, you know, this type of co parental contribution considered in the test group assignments or are all embryos just considered the same? <laughs> Equivalent. Yeah, yeah for, from what I know with screening large libraries, the, the, the approach is to view all embryos as the same. So there's no consideration to parental, uh, whether which parents they came from. Well, you won't know that unless you do a one-on-one -on -one type of mm -hmm. mating. Mm -hmm. And that is extremely inefficient for obtaining the, the number of embryos that you need. That's right. So the key thing is really that you're mating many fish and then you're random and you're basically randomizing the embryos from yeah. those. Yeah parents. Yeah. And I frankly don't know how much the, the results would differ if you did one on one type of mating. I don't. We don't see a lot of variability. I mean, I, I don't know if you noticed it, but we're, we're dealing when we do these types of developmental studies, we can run an N of three to six and have a very good repeatable idea of what it's going to be in two years with a completely different group of fish. Mm -hmm. so. where, it, where it may make a difference is if sex is being used as an endpoint, yeah. um, because it has been shown that, although you, know, you generally get 50, 50, 40, 60 sex ratios, um, if you mate a single pair repeatedly, they will give very similar sex ratios from mating to mating that may be different from hmm. another pair. So there is, at least in the domesticated lines, although there is no strong you know, sex determinant, there are definitely loci that, um, multiple loci that can affect sex. Hmm. So, but, but if I were using sex as an endpoint, I would do what Dr. Padilla does, which is basically, you know, use a very large randomized mating and just combine all those together mm -hmm. so that you, you basically have the average sex ratio of, of the of those fish. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think this comes up when, you know, we're thinking about mammalian studies, we usually if we're doing any kind of developmental exposure, um, you know, correct for litter effects, right? So we do some sort of statistical adjustment for that. And so, I mean, it sounds like oh. that's or, or it should do that. <laughs> well, actually, I mean, well, this just gets us off on a whole nother tangent. If you raise those embryos in us in together in a solution, this is why we put mm -hmm. one per well. Mm -hmm. If you raise those embryos together in a solution, they they have an effect on each other, and you really need to do statistics. Um, I mean, if you're raising fifty embryos in a petri dish, let's say then that needs to be your litter. That needs to be your statistical mm -hmm. litter because there's some really good data mm -hmm. to show that the condition of one embryo may affect the condition of the other embryos. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have the maternal, but we do have the environmental um, contribution. So that is something you do need to worry about and to consider when you're looking at the experimental design. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Allard, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, so uh, we would just talked here about uh, potential, in some cases, some studies that need uh, higher numbers. So I guess a very uh, basic question then, when I review literature involving zebrafish at those early stages for reproduction, what is a well-powered study? What is a good number of animal that would make the, the data uh, appear more sound? Is that, is it really too study dependent? Well, I kind of just like, isn't there partly though, like when you were showing that data between us EPA and Oregon State, I mean, part of it is length of exposure, right? Like more chronic exposure resulted in more robust findings from oh. the 
results, right? And it, it's not, it's partly about the number of embryos, though. So. Well, okay. So in that study, they had 32 embryos per concentration. We right. had, we had five. But um, you saw, but we were dosing every single day. They did right. not dose every single day. And so right. I think that, so it wasn't, they, expo we, we actually exposed for the same amount of time except they just dose once and then we just we renew the solution so i guess that's i mean it, and also theirs was at a different temperature than ours was so um so there are, there were some differences between them um and we don't really know which one contributed to it at all although i do know that there are people that are trying to decipher this out you know is it dosing every day is it removing the chorion is it rearing them at 28 instead of 26 so there's there's various aspects that you could look at, but okay. Yeah, well, I guess what I would say is like that gives you a fine point on the level of the dose response, but in general, what you were seeing is there was a response, though at different gradations depending on some of these. Obviously, experimental factors are important yeah. for that, but you it looked like from that those study results, except for the issue about the hydrophobicity, which seemed to influence yep, both ends. the findings, that there was, I mean, if you looked at the correlation between the responses, it looked like it would be very high. I'm not sure if you did that, but. No, we didn't do that. Yeah. This was for a methods paper. So Patrick was asking, what was the number? I don't, I don't know what, I feel, so when we first started, maybe this is too much, but when we first started testing the ToxCast chemicals, we had three, 400, 500 tests. Um, I was very worried because we were using two to three animals at each concentration. And the statistician explained to me that to calculate the EC50, you're just looking at where it changes, right? So you've got nothing, nothing, nothing happens. And all of a sudden everything happens. And then, then at the higher doses, there it's all lethal and so to calculate that ec50 you're looking for that change and that's a bit different than if you're looking for um if you need to have data to calculate a bmd so for that 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 data calculation requires um more more doses more animals in the area where the change is occurring so you can accurately cal calculate that bmd so well it, yeah um, no i agree i just would say though I mean, your EC50 is like a BMD. It's just a BMD 50, not a BMD 10 or five or something like that. So, I mean, I think your, okay. your earlier point about it didn't, we didn't actually have to have too many of these, I guess, embryos to see some, to at least identify the 50% response, right? Yeah, is that what you're saying? Yeah, because, it, because, Usually nothing happens at the lower doses and everything happens. You see malformations and then quickly you've moved on to death. Usually um, mm -hmm. there are some chemicals like the pyrethroids, which gets back to the solubility question where you never quite reach lethality It's just sort of probably because you can only get so much of the chemical in solution. And after that, nothing, nothing, it, you don't get any increase in solution. And it was really interesting. We looked at some mixtures, some chemicals that tended to be mixtures. And you saw in general, a very protracted dose response curve that there were many, there was much longer, you know, many of those dose responses that I showed you were very quick within two or three concentrations, you've gone from normal to absolutely lethality. So you have to be able to catch it basically if you wanna do a good calculation. I mean, it's a very, in some ways it's a very gross assay. You're going from control to death in, in most cases. Okay, thank you. I guess okay, I can just ask a question, but do you did, you did say that you can measure different developmental aspects, right? Of, of the malform, yeah. And so what happens usually is you get a you get a dose or doses where nothing much is happening. And then the in-between doses, you begin to see the malformations. Right. Okay. And then then the maybe a dose or two higher than that. I mean, these are all half log. So a dose or two higher than that, you're beginning to see mostly lethality. Yeah. And sometimes you see 
I mean, I, sometimes you see uh, at the higher doses, the lethality occurring earlier and earlier and earlier. I mean, there can be also a time component of it too. It looks like we have a couple more hands raised. Thank you, um, Dr. Ayun Kim. I think you're muted still. Um, I think you're st you're still sorry. I can't I'm hear you yet. That, that, <laughs> sorry, doing the the phone mute and computer mute <laughs> unmute. <laughs> Um, so, um, I was just wondering with the, you know, you were talking about like with the, the doses that you go, you know, you see low levels, you don't see anything, you, you go higher and then you see lethality. How much of that has to do with, uh, like the different, um, conditions that might be at each lab, you know, like you mentioned during your talk that there are some labs that, you know, did use different temperatures, some, um, you know, manipulate or some, um, you know, uh, keep the corneal yeah. and others don't. Just how much uh, that can influence the toxicity, the development toxicity that is observed? I don't know, but I would guess because we have we have fiddled around with this a little bit by changing temperatures and also changing whether we dose once or whether we dose multiple times. In general, it does not affect whether you would call the chemical a hit or not. In general, it it doesn't, that doesn't change too much, but the dose, the effective dose or the BMD or the Lowell is what is usually affected when you change those. But it, it may, I mean, I haven't tested all the chemicals in all the different protocols. And so it's hard to tell. Yeah. Understood. But I think, I, I think if you came up, if, if a chemical came up completely negative, it, it is likely it would be completely there's, there's not very much you could do to the protocol to make it a positive, but, but I don't know that. I mean, what situation are you worried about? Are you worried about the dose? Or are you worried about whether the chemical causes overt changes in development? Well, I guess it's over the dose and whether or not you'll see, you know, because we make the decisions on, you know, whether the dose is going to, or whether the chemical is going to be a reproductive toxicant. And so yeah. the dose kind of, because if you dose too low, then you're not going to see it. Then you may have the, you know, make the, a different decision versus if you do see something. But then if we do see something, is it because it was, uh, you know, a super high dose? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we only go as high as 100 micromolar. That is that is our highest dose. And okay. but you see papers that are using millimolar levels. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, you have to figure out. You have to think about how real what. What, how realistic that is, basically. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Draper, did you have any other comments? No, okay. Um, Dr. Pessa, you have your hand raised? Yeah, so I was wondering if we could get some guidance when you are working at high EC50s where you're clearly seeing um, either a behavioral or a morphometric uh, change um, but usually those are at much higher levels than you would ever see in, let's say, serum or urine uh, samples from humans that have been exposed. Do so we, are we, are we, we talking use, about internal dose or are we talking factor? about? Do we use Sorry. an uncertainty factor in interpreting the zebrafish uh, data, much like we would do in a mouse study? Um, I'm, I'm not a risk assessor, so I can't answer that, but I mean, are you talking about internal dose? Or are you talking about nominal dose? What's in the water? Well, I guess we don't have that data for most of the studies, the internal dose. We have the uh, external dose. Right, but pretty soon there should be models that you ought to be able to at least guesstimate within an order of magnitude, I would guess, what the internal dose will be in the zebrafish. So that will help considerably, right? Yeah, it, it would actually. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, kind of turning to another um, 
question that we can uh, continue our discussion thinking about. So studies included in OEA's recent hazard identification documents provide examples of similar biological systems or pathways be, being affected in both zebrafish and mammals by a given chemical, but with different directionality of response or with a different downstream outcome. And so how do we consider differences as well as similarities between species in these kinds of evaluations? And uh, either either one of you would like to start with that? Or anyone else have any kind of additional questions related to that? Well, that, that appears to be more of a risk assessment question, but do they want it to be a biological question? I mean, I know from a risk assessment standpoint, even if you're working with mammals, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the same, exactly the same thing that's happening in rats or mice to, to inform the risk assessment in humans, right? Yes, although I mean, I think I think you know, if there's more consistency among studies, that definitely tends to to strengthen, um, you know, so the evaluation of the association. If anyone else would like to to jump in on that, but it would be, I mean, if you do see, I mean, it, I would think that for certain endpoints, um, you don't have an exact, you know. Com uh, analogous endpoint between a mammalian system and a zebrafish system. So that's not always going to, to be possible to look at exactly the same outcome either. I mean, that's one consideration that, you know, and the question is really, is there an effect? And it may not be the same exact uh, out, uh, downstream outcome, but there, but there are effects. Dr. Woodruff? Yeah, I'm wondering if, I mean, just to uh, say that from those, um, DART reviews, it was a little hard to totally interpret because I think as Stephanie was showing, sometimes the experimental conditions can influence mm -hmm. the exact finding. So, and I don't remember the papers from when we did those reviews, but I, I do think, I think what you're saying, Stephanie, is that in there's a general concord, or actually maybe you, you and um, Bruce can comment yeah. on general concordance of developmental effects compared to specific concordance. So for example, That's in right. cancer, you, I don't know if actually zebrafish do get cancer and we aren't doing that they in do. this committee, but in, for example, when we look at animal and human concordance for cancer, there's in general, you can see concordance, but the sites might be different. So mm -hmm. maybe you could speak to that for developmental and reproductive endpoints. I, I could just comment on the reproductive endpoints. Um, you know, one of the main differences between mammals and fish is that fish are very easy to sex reverse. And so, you know, there's a lot of ways that we can affect, um, you know, the production of these signals that are required to maintain, for example, femaleness. And so at, at multiple levels, you know, a toxicant that affects the somatic gonad, um, could cause sex reversal. A toxicant that affects germ cell development could cause sex reversal. So even though those toxicants wouldn't cause sex reversal in mammals because we don't sex reverse that easily, um, you know, that doesn't mean that it's not hitting the same pathway. It's just that fish are more labile and easier to get to flip. It, yeah, can I, can I just follow up? So are you saying that sex reversal could be an indicator for a different type of sex related effect in humans. Is that uh, absolutely got yes. it? So and sometimes the we... mapping needs to be the outcomes may look different, but the mapping of the general issue is the same. That's correct. So once you know you see something that causes skewed sex ratios, then you can you know from that determine what the cell type is or or system that's being affected. And probably more often than not, it would be the same system in mammals. It's just the the endpoint is going to be different. Right. Thank you, Patrick. So your hand is raised. Yeah. So I guess does that go back to the point that was made earlier that basically zebrafish is a great sentinel species. If you see ovotestis going on in a, in the fish, then it might be a sign indeed that you would have probably very strong hormonal imbalance going on in other species. Yes, I I, I agree with that. Thank you. All right, and I'm looking, I don't see 
Any other? Oh, Dr. Pessa, your hand is raised, or or did you forget to put it down? Okay. <laughs> All right. Then not seeing any other raised hands, and I think we are just about at the time point um, that was allotted for our lunch break, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's actually well past it, apparently. <laughs> um, so that's because we've been having such a wonderful discussion and such great presentations. So um, I'd like to thank both um, Dr. Padilla and Dr. Draper again. And we will now, um, do we want to take 45 minutes for lunch or are we, let's see, I'm gonna look in the chat and see if there's something about that. Um, okay, it looks like, no, we'll, we'll take our 45 minute lunch break as planned. And so, see, I have that it's 12.30 right now. So we would come back at 1.15, unless uh, some one of the staff members wants to, to change that. Lauren, I see you came on. <laughs> I, th I think that is fine. Um, but I did just want to um, ask that uh, we have Carol provide us our Bagley Keen reminder. Yes. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you. I'd just like to remind all the members that during breaks, you aren't allowed to talk amongst yourselves about the subject matter of the meeting. So that includes, once again, phone calls, texts, and chat. And my recommendation would be that you also not talk to third parties regarding that same information. So if you do, then you'll need to disclose the fact that you had a discussion with someone and give the general content of the discussion so that it's part of the public record. It's generally, it's better not to chat. It's just better to chat about something else over lunch. And that's it for now. All right. Thank you. So we'll uh, see everyone uh, at 115. Everybody have a good lunch. Bye-bye. <laughs>